दवस तिहाक में अनलिमिटेड नेटफ्लिक्स बालन अनलिमिटेड डेटा पैक के काक मूल्य पावल टबे अनलिमिटेड फन ने का कारगन आदम में एक्टिव करगन लेंगा तुम में वैटी करगन लाओजी रुपया पन हटा दूँगा मामे एन अब इतने कब बोम Deepening concerns. Over 600 fresh COVID-19 cases confirmed from the country within the day. Did Sri Lanka relax too much? To bury or to cremate? An Indian forensic autopsy on a deceased COVID-19 victim calls into question the WHO guidelines on handling the dead. Reject the opaque. The U.S. urges Sri Lanka to make difficult but necessary choices to secure economic independence ahead of Secretary of State's visit. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Friday, the 23rd of October, 2020. Nava Sunlight Sakura, then Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Mal Suandin. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine, live. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhammi Kekanaika. Let's start with your local stories by taking a look at the pandemic situation. Now, 609 fresh COVID 19 infections were reported from the country within the day, with a bulk of them linked to the Paliagoda fish market. 496 cases from today were attributed to the fish market, making it a considerable subcluster. Now, the day was not necessarily without a silver lining, with 83 people being discharged from hospitals after fully recovering from the virus. The number of infections that were confirmed yesterday from the subcluster at the Paliagoda fish market was 188. They were identified as residents of Dematagoda, Kotahena, Kaduvela, Kalania, Kiribadgoda, Vattala, Kadavata, as well as Moratua in Vallampitiya. Accordingly, 250 PCR tests were conducted at the Jaila Municipal Council grounds on fishmongers and customers who had visited the Paliagoda fish market from the areas of Jaila, Kandana, Vallampitiya and Batagoda. In the meantime, 20 fishermen were diagnosed with COVID-19 following 100 random PCR tests that were conducted on members of the fishing community in the area of Beruwala yesterday. All of them are long-time traders at the Beerola Fisheries Harbour and have been identified as residents of Beerola, Magguna, Munhena, Nallahena, Moragalla and Maradana. Taking this situation into consideration, health authorities took measures to close the Beerola Fisheries Harbour and conduct 700 PCR tests on their close contacts today. Steps were also taken to close the Beerola Pradesh Sabha building and the Aludgama fish market today. Meanwhile, health officials closed a fish stall in a shopping complex located in Homagama today after the owner of the stall was diagnosed with the virus. Ten employees of the stall were directed to self-quarantine. In other developments, another fish stall at the shopping complex in Ratnapura was closed today after the stall's owner's COVID-19 diagnosis was confirmed. Health authorities took measures to direct around 100 persons for self-quarantine in the area of Moogama of Ratnapura. The owner of the fish market had reportedly visited the Paliagoda fish market. Elsewhere, an employee at the Paliagoda fish market who is a resident in the area of Padalangala in Amilipitiya was confirmed as a COVID-19 patient. After returning to his home on the 16th, he had visited several places in Amilipitiya as well as several locations in the locality of Padalangala, including its weekly fair. Accordingly, 20 persons inclusive of 9 of his family members have been directed for self-quarantine. Meanwhile, the son of a fishmonger residing in the area of Bulugahapitiya in Ahliagoda was diagnosed with the virus. He had reportedly bought fish from the Paliagoda fish market and delivered it to his father's fish shop in Ahliagoda. Persons residing in 15 houses and employees of 10 shops identified as his associates have been directed to undergo self-quarantine. In another development, a fishmonger residing at the main street in Valigama in the area of Mathara who had visited the Paliagoda fish market was diagnosed with COVID-19. Due to this, 12 persons involved in fish trade in the area of Valigama have been directed to undergo quarantine. 
In the meantime, out of 166 PCR tests that were carried out in relation to the Gulf Fisheries Harbour yesterday, five persons have tested positive for the virus. As a result, health authorities took steps today to obtain information on those who had visited the Gulf Fisheries Harbour and temporarily close it. Meanwhile, health authorities took measures to temporarily close the main post office in Gaul after a COVID-19 infected patient was identified to have visited the post office. In other developments, an employee at the Colombo dockyard who took part in a funeral in the area of Katowila in Ahungalla was recently diagnosed with COVID-19. Three members of the house where the funeral was held at were confirmed with the virus. With this being the case, health authorities took steps to impose travel restrictions in the areas of Ahungalla, Katowila and Galvehera. Meanwhile, the final rites of the country's 14th COVID-19 victim was held today at the General Cemetery in Kolonava. The 50-year-old woman had been suffering from a heart-related illness as well as from diabetes and kidney disease. Elsewhere, a 26-year-old COVID-19 infected person who was being treated at the Koskahama Regional Hospital escaped from the hospital this morning. He had visited the Paliagoda fish market and is a resident of the area of Sedavatta in Vallampitiya. The police, however, found him on the 13th floor of a house at the Sahaspura housing complex in Boralla. In the meantime, the Government Information Department announced that a total of 609 fresh COVID-19 infections have been confirmed from the country today. In another development, it was announced today that no island-wide lockdown will be imposed over the weekend. The Department of Registration of Persons, meanwhile, has decided to suspend its public services, including the one-day service due to the prevailing COVID-19 situation in the country. Accordingly, its head office and all provincial offices will remain closed until further notice. However, issuance of national identity cards will continue to be carried out at the departmental units in divisional secretariats. Clients who had already made prior appointments to obtain national identity cards and are yet to submit their applications have been requested to submit applications to the Gramaniladaris of their respective areas or divisional secretariats as soon as possible. The one-day service fee will not be charged for these applicants and their national identity cards will be delivered via post without delay. Safeguard Hand Sanitizer Navatama Nishpadana Pella Nero Kimati Vyakata now, authorities say that with the relaxation of COVID-19 regulations that followed due to the absence of COVID-19 infections over the last several months, the data that had been requested by health authorities from industries were not received. With many infections continuing to be confirmed from the island, authorities also put the onus on the people, especially those under self-quarantine, to holistically adhere to the measure as it is impossible to police all of them. Self-quarantine is instituted based on the risk. That is, once you identify a person who is at risk, the health professionals in the field will do a proper risk assessment. And based on that, they will decide what to do, whether to do the PCR today or tomorrow or any other day or not to do PCR. Or whether this person should be quarantined in an institute or whether they could be quarantined at home. And that will be made as an informed decision after doing a proper risk assessment by a trained health staff. I know the next question is, are they adhering to the so-called self-quarantine? This is the problem that we are facing. We know that the Triforces, police and the health workers are monitoring this. But to be frank, we know that it is practically impossible to put a sentry at each and every household. So therefore, it is up to the people who should take the responsibility and make sure that we are adhering to the self-quarantine. So if that is done, I think we should be able to contain this disease very effectively. We have asked everyone to appoint a focal point who is responsible for COVID prevention and response activities and for the workers' health in their respective institutions or enterprises. They have been doing it, but unfortunately, I suppose because of this relaxation process, we did not get the data we wanted. So we have expedited this process now and we have contacted all the BOI zonal managers, had discussions and then of course through them we are getting the details. We have got some but we lack some data. So therefore for those who have not already given this data, for them to contact their zonal managers and give the data as soon as possible. We have categorized it into two categories large scale more than 250 workers medium scale from 250 to 50 workers and then these PHIs or the public health inspectors they are expected to map all such industries 
in their areas, identifying focal points from each enterprise, and to send it to the MOH. MOH has to summarize everything, and then the MOH has to send it to the Environmental and Occupational Health Unit through the proper channels. So we have given the deadline for the medical staff as 25th of October, but I think we need to have this database before the 31st of October at least. Now a forensic autopsy carried out on a deceased COVID-19 victim in India could pave the way for an overhaul of the World Health Organization's guidelines on the proper handling of COVID-19 dead. The autopsy performed by forensic expert Dr. Dinesh Rao in Karnataka has found that the virus remains active in the mouth, throat and nasal passage even 18 hours after death. Dr. Rao says that given the new findings, cremation could be the more prudent method of dealing with virus victims rather than handling, handing them over to their family members for burial rites. There has been much controversy over the government's insistence on the cremation of COVID-19 victims since Sri Lanka reported its first death in March this year. Communities such as the Muslim community raised objections citing cremation as a violation of Islamic law that forbids it and only allows burial. Following the cremation of a 44-year-old Muslim woman in May, rights activists decried the government's move, accusing it of using the pandemic to discriminate against the community. The Ministry of Health, however, decided to stick with cremation as the official method in contravention of World Health Organization guidelines. However, new evidence from an autopsy carried out on a COVID-19 victim in India has unearthed new evidence that may force the WHO to reassess their recommendations. The clinical autopsy on a 62-year-old COVID-19 patient who passed away in Bengaluru, India, has found that the virus could still remain active in the mouth, throat and nasal area 18 hours after death. The autopsy, which is said to be the first to be carried out in the country, was performed last week by Dr. Dinesh Rao, a forensic expert heading the Department of Forensic Medicine at the Oxford Medical College and Research Institute in Karnataka. In his findings carried by Indian media, Dr. Rao says that the autopsy was carried out in order to understand the disease process and its outcome and to study if there was a need to modify treatment protocols. Dr. Rao revealed that swabs taken from the mouth, throat and nose of the deceased had tested positive for the coronavirus COVID-19. However, he also added that no trace of the virus had been found on the skin of the face, neck or internal organs such as the respiratory passage or the lungs. Dr. Rao stated in his findings that given this discovery, it would be advisable to cremate COVID-19 deceased rather than handing over the bodies to their families for burial. In conclusion, the forensic expert added that further research is required to properly understand the disease process in order to modify treatment protocols instead of blindly basing state regulations based on WHO recommendations. We will see you shortly after this break. Stay tuned. Salem Bank. The bank with a heart. Welcome back. This is First at Nine. Difficult but necessary choices will have to be made to secure economic independence instead of choosing opaque practices. That's what an official of the U.S. State Department had to say about Sri Lanka in relation to Secretary of State Michael Pompeo's visit to the island next week. The comment is seen by many as a reference to China's heavy links with Sri Lanka. He adds that U.S. partnership with Sri Lanka is at a point where some choices have to be made about where they head. Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, David Stilwell, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs, Dean Thompson, gave a special briefing on U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo's planned visit to India, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Indonesia. On Sri Lanka, Thompson said that, quote, in the interest of strengthening our long-standing partnership with Sri Lanka and reinforcing our long-term commitment to the region, we encourage Sri Lanka to review the option we offer for transparent and sustainable economic development in contrast to discriminatory and opaque practices, unquote. 
quote, we urge Sri Lanka to make difficult but necessary decisions to secure its economic independence for long-term prosperity and we stand ready to partner with Sri Lanka for its economic development and growth, unquote. Thompson added, quote, We'll continue to urge Sri Lanka to advance democratic governance, human rights, reconciliation, religious freedom and justice, which promotes the country's long-term stability and prosperity and ensure the dignity and equality of all Sri Lanka's diverse communities, unquote. When asked to what extent he is concerned about the trajectory of human rights and democracy in Sri Lanka, in the backdrop of the Sri Lankan parliament giving new powers to President Gotabir, Thompson said, quote, We watch closely developments in Sri Lanka on these fronts, and the Secretary will of course be raising issues related to human rights, reconciliation and our common commitment to democracy. Our partnership with Sri Lanka goes back a long way through a lot of different eras and right now we think they are at a point to make some choices about where they head." Unquote. Meanwhile, in response to a question, Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, David Stilwell noted how the previously U.S. Pacific Command then became the Indo-Pacific Command and insisted that the U.S. approach to security in the region doesn't stop at the Straits of Malacca. Now, the 20th Amendment to the Constitution was passed with a two-thirds majority in Parliament yesterday and it will be considered as the country's law once signed by Speaker Mahindya Pabe Vardhana. Raising eyebrows, eight members of the opposition voted in support of the new amendment. With the introduction of the new amendment, the executive now possesses the power to make high-level appointments to the country's judiciary to appoint the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Concluding the debate on the second reading of the 20th Amendment Draft Bill, a vote was conducted at 7.30 last night. 156 votes were cast in favour of the bill, while only 65 were cast against. Out of the 223 seats currently occupied by members of parliament, 222 members barring the speaker had the opportunity to vote. Chairman of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, former President Maitri Palasirisena, was not present in the parliament yesterday. Accordingly, the remaining 148 members of the ruling party, along with eight members representing the Sajid Premadasa-led opposition, voted in favour of the 20th Amendment. Apart from the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress leader Rauf Hakim, who was elected from the Samagi Janabalavegia, his fellow party members, namely parliamentarians Nazir Ahmad, Fezal Qasim, Mohammad Hariz and M. S. Taufik, voted in favour of the amendment. All Ceylon People's Congress leader Rishad Badiuddin's party members Ishaq Rahman and Ali Sabri Rahim also voted in favour of the 20th Amendment. In addition, TNA MP Arvind Kumar, who is under the leadership of Mano Ganesan, also voted for the bill. Nationalist MP of Samagi Janabalavege, Tayana Gamage, too, was in favour of it. Parliamentarian of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksha, who was a strong critic of the 20th Amendment, also voted in favour. Later, commencing the third reading of the 20A Bill, also known as the Committee Stage, Minister of Justice President's Council Ali Sabri added 57 articles to the Amendment Bill. Thereafter, Chief Opposition Whip Lakshman Kiriala called for a vote on the dual citizenship article included in the bill. A vote was duly taken with 157 voting for and 64 voting against the article. Diga Madula District MP SMM Musharraf, representing Muslim National Alliance led by Rishad Badiuddin, who voted against 28 during the second reading vote, voted in favour of enabling dual citizens to represent the parliament. The 20th Amendment to the Constitution was passed in parliament by a two-thirds majority and it will become the law of the country once signed by the Speaker. Meanwhile, following yesterday's parliamentary session, an opposition MP who voted in favour of the 20th Amendment expressed views to media. SJB MP Diana Gamage meanwhile explained her reasons behind the decision to support the 20th Amendment on her way out of the Parliament today. Meanwhile, 
දැන් ඔබ තුමියට විරුද්ධව විනය ක්‍රියා මාර්ග ගන්න හදන්නේ පක්ෂෙන් මොකක්ද විනය පරීක්ෂණ කරපු දින එතනට එතනට ආවහම අපි ඒකට මූණ දෙමු දැන් මේකේ හැමදාම ගෝඨාභය රාජපක්ෂ මේක බදාගෙන සදාවකල් තියන් ඉන්න දෙයන්නේ නෑනේ තව කෙනෙක් හෙට අනිද්ද තව අවුරුදු පහකින් ජනාධිපති වෙන්න පුළුවන්නේ ඒ සජිත් ප්‍රේමදාස මැතිතුමා වෙන්න පුළුවන්නේ එතුමා එතකොට ඇවිල්ලා කියනවද නෑ මට ඒ පාමේ බලය එතකොට එතුමා මේ ජනතාවට දෙන පොරොන්දු ඉටු කරන්නේ කොහොමද මේකට මම එකඟයි මම එකඟයි මේ රට ඉදිරියට යන්න ඕන දැන් සජිත් ප්‍රේමදාස මහතා කතා කළ මොකද ඇහුවේ චන්දේ දුන්නා ඉන්පස්සේ ඔබතුමිය එතුමාගේ කිසි මේ මොකද එතුමාට මම දන්න ලා ගියා එතුමා එපා කිව්වේ නැද්ද එතුමා එපා කිව්වා එතුමා ඔබතුමිය වග කීමෙන්ද කියන ඔබතුමිය මුදලට විකුණු නැහැ මට සල්ලි ඕන නැහැ මොකද මට සල්ලි මට සල්ලි දෙන්න with the introduction of the new amendment several constitutional changes are to take place from now on under the observation of parliament the president is vested with the power to appoint the chief justice justices of the supreme court the president of the court of appeal and its judges the attorney general the inspector general of police the auditor general and the ombudsman The article which says the president shall on the advice of the prime minister appoint from among members of parliament ministers to be in charge of the ministries will be repealed in the 20th amendment and the president will have the power to appoint the prime minister and ministers at his discretion also the president possesses the power to have a ministerial post under his purview The number of members of the three member election commission has been revised to 5 and the president is given the power via the constitution to appoint members of the commission as well as its chairman. The president has been empowered by the new amendment to dissolve parliament after two and a half years of its sitting, amending the previous article which stated that the parliament cannot be dissolved until four and a half years of its sitting. The Constitutional Council will henceforth be abolished. Its right to appoint members to independent commissions too will be abolished and instead the Parliamentary Council has been introduced by the 20th amendment. Being a dual citizen will no longer serve as a disqualification to run for the presidency or a parliamentary election as the barrier was removed by the newly passed amendment. The power to appoint heads of departments is now vested in the cabinet by the 20th amendment. Meanwhile by the 20th amendment the number of supreme court judges has been increased from 11 to 17 and the number of justices of the court of appeal has also been increased from 12 to 20 while appointing the president as the authority to make such appointments the 20th amendment however will keep the term of office of the president at a maximum of 5 years and a maximum of 2 terms It will also retain the number of cabinet ministers at 30 and the maximum number of deputy ministers at 40. Apart from these the 20th amendment does not include any proposals that require a public referendum for passing. We will see you shortly bear with us. Welcome back this is first at 9. Now the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing these to Sunday terror attacks yesterday questioned well yesterday questioned uh, at the commission I should say questions were raised over the recording of evidence from the widow of terrorist Zafran Hashim Abdul Qadir Fatima Hadia due to concerns that it could complicate ongoing legal proceedings against her After the commission decided to deliberate the matter the fourth magistrate ordered her to be produced before the commission today where her testimony was recorded without the presence of media personnel The widow of East Attack ringleader Zaharan Hashim Abdul Qadir Fatima Hadia was brought before the Presidential Commission for the first time yesterday. However, questions were raised whether she could be called to give evidence before the commission while legal proceedings related to the East Attacks were still ongoing. Due to this, no statement was recorded from her yesterday. The commission stated yesterday that it would deliberate on the issue and announce its final decision on whether her testimony would be recorded in due course. Fatima Hadia was detained by the Criminal Investigation Department under the Prevention of Terrorism Act following the encounter between security forces and the remaining members of Zahran's terror cell at Sain de Mardu. Meanwhile due to the expiration of the detention order against her Fatima Hadia was produced before the fourth magistrate last afternoon and was remanded until the 4th of November In addition the magistrate yesterday ordered the suspect to be produced before the presidential commission today Following this prisons department officers brought Fatima Hadia before the presidential commission today Accordingly the presidential commission decided to go ahead with the recording of her evidence However the proceedings were not open to the media Meanwhile criminal investigation department officers in the Batiklo district located and seized a van that had been used to transport members of Zahran's terror cell to its extremist training camp in Nur Elia 
Investigators revealed that a suspect identified as Mohammadu Hanifa Mohammadu Akram, who is currently in remand custody, had transported the suspects to Norelia in the van that was seized. It was also revealed that the van had been placed for sale at a vehicle dealership in Samanthure last month after it had failed to attract any buyers at a car sale in Kandy for a period of three months prior to that. Following this, the van had been purchased by its current owner on the 4th of September. The vehicle has been handed over to the Kartankudi police for further investigations by the Batiklo District CID officers. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.